Okay, condenser selections. Um, again, same criteria. No? You take uh, more factors into account. No? If Rassi considers everything that uh, the opposition is capable of, then hopefully they will have a plan for anything that the team can throw at them. Same here. No? So, um, we're going to be selecting something from the standard product range. Okay, so uh, what is your main deciding factors? Um, what's your footprint? No? So you climb on the supermarket roof, maybe you're doing a refurbishment. What's the space that's available? No? So you can't take the old one off and put the new one on. You've got to have both of them running in parallel and gradually switch over. Huh? If any of you done a supermarket refurbishments? Huh? So, yeah, it's challenging. So your footprint quite often decides what is the kind of condenser you're going to select. Huh? It's, a, it's, a, it's quite a, a, yeah. So horizontal or vertical discharge. Okay, for the greater part, I prefer vertical discharge. And the reason is simply that the likelihood of recirculation drops significantly. Huh? If you have a horizontal discharge condenser, Remember, on the suction side of the fan, there's low pressure. Huh? So if there's low pressure, you've got this migration of exit air going around the condenser. Okay. Accuracy of your selection. Again, now, so you start off with your evaporator selection first, and then, of course, you move on to your condenser selection, not the other way around. Okay. And then hopefully you did things accurately when you selected an evaporator. Okay, what refrigerant are you going to be using? Huh? Again, there's a, and this comes down to the latent heat of vaporization for every refrigerant. Um, don't want to go into details there, but basically it comes down to latent heat of vaporization is how much heat, heat, how much heat absorption can a kilogram of uh, condensed high pressure liquid have when it changes phase. Uh, so, the latent heat of vaporization influences these factors. The condensing temperature that you require. So, um, I've, seen, uh, I've seen tender documents issued where the target condensing temperature was 45 degrees C and it's Friedendahl and the ambient is 47. Not possible. No? So, you can't have the target condensing temperature colder than the ambient air that you're going to use. So, sorry if that sounds facetious, but it does seem to puzzle some folks. Okay, and remember your ambient air is the air that you're going to draw into the condenser. Now, why do we use air? Well, it's free, huh? So, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's an option. Uh, you can use water, but air is most commonly used. Okay. And the altitude, where is your condenser going to operate? Now the air is thinner in Johannesburg and Cape Town air, a cubic meter of air is 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. I think it's like 989 kilograms in, in Johannesburg. So hopefully it makes sense. Your fans doesn't know the density of the air. The, your fans draws a specific volume through the coil. So if the air is less dense, no? The fans work longer to draw the same volume across the coil. So you can understand, hopefully, that condenser in Johannesburg is less effective. Huh? Because it's about the mass flow of air drawn across the condenser coil. Um, again, you have inner groove tubing. Gives you bigger uh, uh, surface area on the inside of the, of the tube. Uh, not always uh, possible because of high pressure that some uh, systems might operate. Aluminium fin, hydrophilic coated fin, when you're in Hermanus, you want some protection on the fin material. Eh? And uh, some people love copper fin. It's extremely costly, it's very heavy, but it is the specification that uh, I believe was the norm for many retailers for a very long time. Eh? I think they've changed that for the greater part now. Uh, yeah, and of course the casing, Mostly galvanized casings that powder coated, eh? especially the standard product range. Okay, that's what the catalog looks like. And uh, if you're a melancholy, you like columns and tables and eh? okay. Again, where's your condenser now? Nah? 
So you want to, um, you, how do you calculate your um, condenser's capacity? Well, um, you start off with uh, the heat load and you uh, add the input power of your compressor. And that ultimately gives you your total heat rejection. So it's as simple as that. No? So whatever energy your compressor draws from the grid, that energy is turned into heat energy and it's added to the heat energy you're absorbing in the evaporator and the sum of those two you need to reject outside. Huh? So all that electrical energy your compressor consumes ends up in the refrigerant. Huh? It adds to your condenser's load. Okay, so your total heat rejection is your heat absorbed plus your compressor power, you turn the amps into wattage and you add it to the evaporator's load. Okay, and that's your total heat rejection. Okay, and then what safety factors do you apply? Hey, is it an ice cream freezer room for the super spar in Paul? You're going to add a safety factor. Yeah, I would suggest one. Huh? If your ice cream room goes down, you get as few places you're going to be able to hide. Huh? If it's a bakery cold room, no, it's less crucial. If it's a meat packing area, it's less crucial. Huh? So, uh, okay, so your safety factors you can add on top of that. And again, that's something you you have to develop over time. That's hopefully expertise your customer is paying you for when you claim to be experienced. All right. The calculation is a little longer, but very similar. Again, you start with a target load, but you apply two additional factors. Okay. So, um, the first factor is the delta T. So the catalog shows you a heat rejection when the delta T is 15K. So the catalog figures is quite often published. You must read the, read the page. The, fi the published figures is with a split at 15K split. So in other words, if the ambient air is 30 degrees Celsius, then you can condense at 45 and that's the duty the condenser will offer with a 15k split okay so how cop das on what is the split you might have on the site and there's a small formula you apply the f2 that's your correction factor for your refrigerant quite easy hopefully and then your um your geographical factor huh? the altitude above sea level as you go up, as you approach Joburg, then of course the air gets thinner and you might need to size a condenser a little bigger. Huh? And uh, of course, what material are you going to be using? Okay, quite important. What kind of condenser do you like? Remember we started off vertical discharge, horizontal discharge. Nah? So what's the customer want? Whatever is the cheapest. Okay. So there's many options there, and uh, of course, of course, uh, uh, um, you have um, a variety of condensing units there. Vertical discharge, the V-type is quite popular, and of course, then you draw air in from both sides. Discharge vertical. Okay, condenser selection. Let's start with that cold room that we had initially. Okay, um, so our heat load was 3.2 kilowatt. We want to have the room operating at zero. Your refrigerant is R134A. Your ambient is 38. Na? Where's the 38? Stephen, what's the ambient in Paul? 42. Makluk. Yeah, so this is obviously not Paul. Maybe it's Paro. Okay, 38. Your condensing temperature, you want to condense at 45. What's the delta T? What's the difference between 45 and 38? Okay, so it's at sea level. It's at sea level and the specification says 
it must be coated fin, eh? hydrophilic coated fin. Okay, so that's something you need to consider as well. So I've just taken a clip from the Fraskold uh, compressor selection software. And uh, there uh, I selected a compressor. So you see there's the evaporative capacity. Our target is 3.2. Now, I can't find a compressor that's going to do exactly 3.2. No? Closest one I can find is going to do 3.3 kilowatt. Okay. So 3.3 kilowatt, that's close enough. I'm happy with that. Your evaporative capacity, the 3. Point, I'm using the 3.32, not the 3.2. No? So my condenser needs to reject the heat, not the theoretical figure I'm using, but what's the compressor going to do? So I use that value. When you have a big system, there could be that discrepancy could be bigger. So I'm using the evaporative capacity the compressor can offer. And of course, what is the input power? The compressor is going to require 1.26 kilowatt to deliver those conditions with 134A. And that adds up to 4.58 kilowatt. Okay, so that's your, that's what you start off with, right? Now, that formula there, 7, our delta T is 7, divide by 15, that's our value there, that's F1, we apply the rest, 134A, the conversion factor for 134A is 0 0.93, huh? the uh, aluminium fin that we're using is there, oh sorry, C level is 1, and then uh, the hydrophilic coated fin is 0 0.97, you lose a bit of capacity when the fin is coated. Huh? So, small bit, but you lose a bit of capacity. And then again, you have to add a safety factor. Are you going to apply a safety factor? You know your site. You know what's at risk. Huh? So, you can apply the spur uh, sign, uh, go big or go home. But ultimately, you've got to apply something that is going to make financial sense. And in most cases, you're quoting against someone else. Huh? So you got a nitpick, you got a nitpick where you're possible, where you can sharpen your pencils where possible and not be excessively uh, big on everything. Okay, so our target there was 10,87. You go to your tables, 10,87. Okay, 10,3. Any? You happy with 10,3? So Biki Aina. Huh? Okay, so. Let's go for the 11,7. Then there's a bit of a safety factor. Huh? Okay, so that is a base mounted horizontal. Okay, it's one of those, those animals there. So that's an option. Huh? So now, but basically what I'm trying to get you to understand is you calculate a value and then you look at the values in the, the nominal values in the table. Just read the instructions from the supplier that you're working with. Huh? It's not that complex. Hopefully we make it as simple as possible. But what you've got to understand so you don't cheat yourself with the formulas is that when you apply an altitude factor, obviously the air is thinner. Né? Uh, when you apply a, a different refrigerant, some refrigerants is more effective than others. Uh, okay. You guys look really tired. Okay, condenser. Let's do another example. Let's say your heat load is 24 kilowatt. Freezer room. No? Jock, it's your ice cream room. That customer doesn't take any prisoners when the ice cream goes pop. Okay? Why is, so, yeah. Sorry, why is 404 is standard It's uh, most commonly used. Uh, it's an HFC. So the figures... Uh, so in, some, in some cases, your, uh, value, your capacity improves with 404 over 507, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, no? I can confirm that. Yeah. I so, think, yeah. so uh, yes, certainly. Uh, I would say uh, 404 for low temperature conditions is uh, preferred. Um, but, uh, you know, everything has its vices. Um, again, I've taken a, a compressor from the Fraskold selection software and 
there you have the the power input um, okay so uh, we have a, we have a, how did I get to that 26 kilowatt 26.1 what did I do there okay there's a ah, there it is the 26 26.61 that's your evaporative capacity the compressor will offer no it's not the 24 kilowatt that your theoretical heat load is huh does that make sense and there's your power input and the sum of that of course is 44 kilowatt okay again your formula there but look at that 38 versus 43 no i want to condense a bit lower so it's quite common for low temperature rooms uh, they want the system to condense a little bit lower and that is simply to reduce the discharge temperature in most cases now that's the main uh, reason for that so 43 difference between 43 and 38 is 5 uh, so that's that's your 5 there 5 divided by 15 apply the formula and uh, your nominal value is 147 kilowatt okay you can apply a safety factor uh, so again you know your site application there's your uh, v-shaped condensers okay that's an option and uh, of course your flat deck vertical discharge in both cases it's vertical discharge and uh, just note of course please um, with the v-shaped and uh, the twin row flat deck units you actually have two separate coils you have your coil on the left hand side and the right hand side and you have to tube them together no? so it's not it doesn't don't take it for granted that they are that they are piped together um, certainly we've built many systems where you have a, a MTA on the left hand side and MTB on the right hand side huh? so then you have one condenser but you've got two separate circuits next to one another um, if you want them piped together you can have that as an optional extra but um, basically your total capacity is both coils added together no. okay so you add those together and then you get your total capacity i'm gonna go for the 161 kilowatt now make sure that on a hot day we can keep uh, the ice cream nice and cool all right so what about 410a catalog figures is not suitable for 14a okay 14a is mostly air conditioning applications operating pressures is higher and hence the standard catalog items is not suitable okay uh, so uh, I mean when I ask lots of people what's your 14a systems pressure um, I get different answers but I'm guessing it's in the region of 40 to 45 bar huh? um, and of course your standard inner groove uh, copper tubing for a catalog listed evaporator is not suitable for those conditions um, HFC systems 14 uh, uh, 404 uh, 507 your pressure relief valve on your liquid receiver is going to be 31 bar uh, or 450 psi okay any questions we're almost halfway Almost halfway. No questions. Serious. Okay. So um, now, uh, just briefly, uh, 